welcome to everyone uh, to this uh, extremely promising topic that Jatin Dua is going to speak about. Uh, the speaker will be introduced by my colleague Dilip Menon. But I just want to say it is uh, such a pleasure to have Jatin speak to us on the platform of the Center for Interagent Research. I'm speaking from uh, you know, uh, that space here. And uh, this is part of the Indian Ocean and Beyond series, which is also subtitled Outward Bound from Gujarat. Um, we don't seem to have too many people from Gujarat today, but I'm, you know, they usually do show up. It's also Navratri in uh, Gujarat and people stay up most of the night. So it's maybe one of the reasons why students are not here today. Uh, however, we are recording this and uh, with your permission, we will put it up. We have our series on YouTube and I think there will be more people uh, listening in as uh, we go forward. So this is, uh, you know, a, really a pleasure and we look forward to hosting uh, Jatin Dua in person at the center sometime soon. He has actually promised to come visit us early next year. So go ahead, Dilip. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Teju. And uh, uh, Jatin uh, uh, has been uh, known to the Center for Indian Studies in Africa, where I am, at the University of Witwatersrand for quite a few years now. We've been at workshops together, we've been at seminars together and so on. And... Uh, uh, Jatin is currently an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, but he's had a kind of peripatetic uh, life. He grew up in India and in California. He studied law in Cairo, did a PhD at Duke, uh, and he's finally here at Ann Arbor. His work, as some of you may be familiar, is on maritime piracy in the Indian Ocean and more generally uh, looking at the historical connections on the East African coast, which ties in very uh, well with the kinds of themes of the seminar, which is to look at the extensions of land into the ocean and of ocean into the land. So that we're really thinking beyond these national boundaries, thinking about uh, less about proximity and contiguity and more about the connections between East Africa and Gujarat, for example. Uh, so uh, Jatin's uh, work captured at sea, uh, piracy and protection in the Indian Ocean which came out in 2019, uh, marked a big departure in maritime studies on South Asia, largely because it dealt with a group of people that we uh, deal with historically. Uh, we have with the work, uh, you know, uh, work by Lakshmi Subramaniam and others on this, but what he did was a kind of ethnography, so which brings us to the other side of uh, Jatin's role as an undercover specialist. So he hung out with Somalian pirates chewing tobacco and uh, hanging around on boats, something I could never do given my weak stomach. And he also hung out at the other end of the spectrum with Lloyd's Insurance. He worked with Lloyd's Insurance as, uh, for a while, as I think as an intern, wasn't it, uh, Jatin? Yeah, to try and figure out that whole complex of credit risk, uh, maritime uh, security and so on. And the book, in particular dealt with the uh, what he called the ransom economy of Somalian pirates. It involved Somalian pirates, Indian Dhau captains, and of course Lloyds, uh, which was underwriting many of the losses. Then his work, I think, which um, uh, this ongoing work, which I'm slightly familiar with, looks at uh, navigating the Bab el Mandeb, which is a key uh, maritime choke point in the in Indian Ocean. For uh, those of us who assume that sea travel is something that's a thing of the past, romance and so on, when the ship got stuck uh, athwart the Indian, uh, athwart the Suez Canal, we re suddenly realized that 90% of the world's trade is carried on on the ocean. So having choke holes and choke points on the ocean is of crucial importance for the way in which capitalism itself functions. So thinking about questions of risk, questions of credit, questions of governance and so on. And uh, uh, finally, I think the third theme that he's looking at is something again uh, as a departure given the nature of his original and pioneering work, which looks at African mobility in the Indian Ocean. This is ongoing work and we should, hopefully we'll see the publications as and when he does them, which looks at the idea of shipping and maritime capitalism, looks at the question of seafaring and port making as he calls it, so the idea here is to kind of move away from the sad and tragic story of black and brown bodies which are flung, so to speak, willy-nilly into the labor markets of the ocean. And here we're actually looking at seafaring very much in the same way as we would look at 
European travels. I mean, there is the idea that Europeans travel for pleasure, profit, and adventure, and Indians and Africans have little option. They kind of press ganged or shanghaied into this. And I think uh, Jatin's work will help us qualify uh, this argument considerably. Uh, he uh, won uh, an award, the Jack Goody Award last year for a wonderful essay, which I think everybody should read. I mean, if they don't have the time to read the book, they should read the article, which will give you a sense of his work. It's called Hijacked Piracy and Economics of Protection in the Western Indian Ocean. It came out in the Comparative Studies in Society and History. And for those of you who are interested, you can Google this. It's also an interview. So if you don't even have the time to read the article, Jatin speaks about the article so that you can get a sense of what it is that he's saying. So welcome, Jatin. Uh, delighted to be part of this ongoing narration on the ocean, piracy, and uh, maritime capitalism. So the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Dilip, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you, uh, to Jasmine and Dilip for the invitation to speak here. Um, and for those of you who are interested, I'm very happy, please, you know, if you can't access the article, I'm happy to pirate that for you um, and send, I guess, <laughs> and send it along. But um, um, uh, yeah, so today I'm excited to be talking and sharing some of my work and I will also share a screen so that. All right. Great. So, so the materials for today's talk emerge both from my first book, Captured at Sea, Piracy and Protection in the Indian Ocean, um, as well as current research on, on what is turning into a second book project. And this is what the was mentioning on ports and straits in the Indian Ocean from the Bab al-Mandeb, extending now to the Straits of Hormuz and the Straits of Malacca, from Singapore to Dubai, from um, Mundra to Bosaso. In both projects, I foreground slowdown, stuckness, and interruption as key to comprehending maritime space. I ask what happens when itineraries are interrupted, and what if we understand the ocean not only as a space of endless flow and mobility, but also captivity and stuckness. And you know, this, this came in a way very viscerally in recent year, in, uh, you know, last year when the ship was stuck um, and the Ever Given was stuck at um, in the Suez, right, from ship's quarantine, as well as an increased number of cargo ships that have been quarantined following COVID outbreaks on board, to ships stuck in the Suez Canal, increasingly wind gusts and storms that have increased with frequency due to climate change have led to port closures. Stuckness and its consequences for global supply chains are increasingly visible. Today, I want to tell two stories of this kind of stuckness in the Indian Ocean. And I tell this through some familiar figures of the Indian Ocean archive. Part one of this talk focuses on pirates and part two turns to ports. From small fishing boats stitched together with balsa wood and rope to lumbering super tankers, leviathans of metal and machine, Millions of vessels and millions of seafarers are currently afloat in the ocean. Almost everything we eat, wear, or otherwise consume on a daily basis has some connection to these vessels and global shipping. Some 90% of global trade, approximately 6 billion tons of cargo, travels on over 100,000 cargo ships operated by over a million seafarers. And the map behind is, is a kind of illustration on a number of these uh, uh, you know, open source websites where you can track ships um, as they move through the world's oceans. You know, the Western Indian Ocean is a central hub in this global shipping economy. Between 22,000 and 25,000 vessels transit through the Suez on a day, um, each year, and every day 3.3 million barrels of oil are transported through the Babel month. This contemporary mobility builds on long histories of movement and exchange in the Indian Ocean whereby the 10th century a ring of coastal towns connected Mogadishu to Malacca and along whose pathways traveled a dazzling array of material objects, free and unfree people and a world religion. As an anthropologist of law, economy and mobility in the Indian Ocean, my work is informed by three larger interdisciplinary debates and scholarly conversations. 
First, in recent years, a burgeoning set of literatures has turned to transregional spaces such as oceans to show how law and capitalism operate beyond the methodological and conceptual con confines of the nation state. My work draws from this emerging literature, and in fact, a very you know, kind of old robust literature, thinking of world systems theory and others, to show how divisions between law and custom, trade and finance, obfuscate more than they reveal. Instead, my research emphasizes concepts that emerge from these spaces, concepts like protection, aban, that reveal multiple facets of a shared world, one that is nonetheless structured by deep-seated inequalities. And, and this is more about in my current work, which has turned to questions of infrastructure and logistics. Um, my work highlights the centrality of social relations, the continuing centrality of social relations in shaping material worlds and the embeddedness of infrastructural and logistical projects from oil platforms to water distribution networks within social and political lives. In conversation with a number of scholars in, um, who are thinking critically about infrastructure and logistics, I look at the ephemeral and lasting ways in which particularly kinship and long histories are central to making places like ports as well as shipping lanes and how these places wax and wane. So I'm interested in the kind of this, this long durée sense of ephemerality that I think is kind of central to how we understand questions around connectivity and rupture in the Indian Ocean. And which brings me to finally, um, you know, my engagement with scholarship on the Indian Ocean, where, which has been primarily fueled by historians and anthropologists who have highlighted the importance of mobility and circulation. This is a region crafted and created through centuries of arrivals and departures, through connections that endure across centuries, connections that always exceed the territorial logics of empires and nation states. If the ocean is a kind of theory machine, as the anthropologist Stefan Helmrich has noted, its theoretical concepts are of fluidity. The historical and ethnographic emphasis on mobility, traveling goods, people, and texts is testament to the generative power of this form of oceanic theory making. By emphasizing the importance of slowdown and interruption, I bring to the fore the peril, but, but importantly, the possibility of immobility in shaping Indian Ocean worlds. In what follows, I focus, to, I focus on how both piracy and second port making are both dependent on making claims on mobile objects at sea therefore transforming themselves, pirates and ports, into choke points, places of constriction and slowdown. What I wish to emphasize through this comparison is not only to befuddle certain distinctions of legality and illegality of land and sea, to ask perhaps that maybe there's something that, that ties together pirates and port makers in uh, but also to emphasize the contingent and surprising forms of cohabitation that happen when pirate skiffs and thous encountered each other at sea and when ships stock portside. It is to ask us to focus on what makes possible circulation and its interruption, but also what happens in spaces of stuckness and waiting. In both cases, I pay attention to a specific site, the hold of a thou and the quarantine of a port as locations where the peril and possibilities of stuckness are negotiated. And in both cases, Gujarati seafarers emerge as key protagonists, exemplifying the reach of these diasporic sailors well beyond the shores of Gujarat. Part one, they call hospitality in the hold. From 2008 to 2012, a dramatic upsurge in maritime piracy transformed the Western Indian Ocean. During this time period, over a thousand ships were attacked. Of these, 218 resulted in successful hijackings with the abduction of over 4,000 crew members of 100 different nationalities. In my book, Captured at Sea, I explore Somali piracy and the ransom economy that operated off the coast of Somalia that brought into contact a whole host of actors from Mogadishu, Singapore, London, and beyond. And the book looks at what 
Philip was also mentioning the kind of the emergence of this ransom economy that was not only something built by uh, the actual capture of a ship, but the transformation of that capture into a ransom that involved engagement with ransom negotiators, insurance companies, as well as um, you know kinship networks on land and sea. But today um, I want to emphasize a particular encounter within this larger ransom economy. As piracy became a floating diaspora that scattered across the Indian Ocean. So we see in this map a kind of expansion outward of um, pirate attacks and you know, including ones that were the easternmost attack, which was about 40 nautical miles off the coast of India. Reports, reports emerged of pirate skiffs attaching themselves to motherships, specifically motorized sailing vessels, dhows that go from port to port in the Indian Ocean. And there's a rich, both historical, but also increasingly um, an anthropological scholarship on this contemporary dhow trade. I'm thinking here of the work of um, scholars like Ed Simpson and Nidhi Mahajan's forthcoming work on dhow, and I think Nidhi's also you know, slated to speak in the series, um, looking at the kind of social lives and the continued um, importance of this wooden ship in um, contemporary, in stitching together contemporary Indian Ocean trade. So today I want to focus on a particular encounter, which is when Daos became what was called motherships, places both of refuge and, um, and violence, but also of refuge and hospitality. The embodiment of dense trade networks of the Indian Ocean, as well as the object of its regulation, the Tao by the 19th century was already a vestige of the past. Seen as part of a traditional pre-modern trading world of slaves and spices, the Tao was for the British and other colonial powers an anachronism in an era of free trade and steamers. And here, this is um, work that both Fahad Bishara and Johan Matthews have talked a lot about this relationship between um, you know, ideas about free trade and, its, um, and where they abutted um, uh, the world of the Tao. With the advent of decolonization and a certain post-colonial lockdown in, Southeast, uh, in South Asia and East Africa, the Tao of the 19th century faded, some would argue, into the register of the nostalgic and the artisanal. However, many other currents were afoot. The wooden boats that circulate in the Western Indian Ocean, and this is a, a, an image from a shipbuilding yard in Mantvi, um, where I did some research for the piracy project, um, you know, because these boats were deeply central, especially once commercial ships stopped going to Somali ports because of insurance region, uh, reasons, DAOs moved back into that market um, and, and, and often were the only link between Somalia and, uh, and the rest of the world from at least 2008, um, 2012 onwards. So these wooden boats that circulate in the Western Indian Ocean today are nothing like their historic counterparts. Weighing often an average of 20,000 deadweight tons, these boats are essentially small bulk carriers with a rudimentary sail. As a captain explained to me, I think we could use oars to make us move faster than if we, than if we used our sail. Necessary for government inspection and classification, the label DAO exists primarily as a legal fiction for tax and classification purposes. So there's a different set of rules that um, govern the movement of DAOs, which is partly why they were able to continue to go and um, into um, the Western Indian Ocean at the height of the piracy um, trade. However, this does not mean that this is an unregulated trade. In early 2010, when seven Indian thous were hijacked off the coast of Somalia and over 97 seafarers, primarily from Kutch, were held captive, um, you know, the Indian government uh, moved quickly to try and regulate and ban the, um, the movement of ships between um, UAE and uh, between India and Somalia. Sh ships then ended up going through the through UAE, which is where they were going to pick up um, their goods anyway, um, and would then end up, you know, shift flags and then move to um, Somalia. So there was a way in which they constantly keep evading the various kinds of regulatory systems um, that, were, um, that were in place to keep them. 
But one of the consequences of this constant act of evasion was that the house found themselves as unwitting accomplices in the story of Somali piracy. When these ships were hijacked, they were hijacked not for the value of cargo that was on these ships, but rather um, they were transformed into a contemporary version of 19th century motherships. And here is, you know, like one of the main ports where so DAOs would move between flags. So here is a DAO that's unloading in Somalia, has an old Somali flag. So ostensibly, this is a way to um, evade the kind of regulatory system that I was um, talking about that banned Indian ships from going into Somali waters. That was could say, like many cargo ships also do, is that they are, you know, by being flagged to a different country, that they are essentially, you know, belong to a different place. So, but in in the case of the relationship between Daos and Somali piracy, they transformed into this, the mothership. So what is a mothership? During the height of the whaling boom in the 19th century, motherships were central in expanding the reach of the whaling trade by functioning as a base from which smaller, faster cutters could be launched to chase and kill whales. The whale meat was then processed and stored in these large ships, a practice that continues to this day in the fishing industry, where motherships are now called factory ships used to store and process catch. For whalers, motherships were both floating factories, but importantly, and this is where the, this resonates with the Tao, ways of domesticating the sea, of extending intersubjective space-time in watery domains. Instead of a vessel that allowed whalers to travel far and wide in search of lumbering giants that illuminated the 19th century, the Tao's mothership enabled pirates to catch a different beast, the oil tanker, that fuels contemporary globalization. Daos promised a modicum of stability in the monsoonal open waters of the Indian Ocean, an ability to traverse long distances and extend the amount of time one could spend at sea. This made it possible to transform Somali piracy from a coastal practice of raiding and protection um, seeking into a Western Indian Ocean practice, as well as to evade naval patrols. Additionally, attaching itself to the Tao was a way for pirates to blend into maritime traffic. The sea is not an empty space, from pieces of ambergris to schools of tuna, from small fishing boats to post Panamax cargo ships, a variety of objects circulate, float, drown, and are washed ashore constantly. The Tao was yet another way to blend into this crowded world at sea and provide camouflage and cover. So instead of you know, going on small fishing boats that would be easily, in a way, you know, known as being out of place if they extended far beyond Somali waters, being attached to a Dao was a way to avoid this, um, this form of surveillance, the various kinds of from drones to military naval vessels that were at sea um, um, and, and kind of move farther and farther out into the Indian Ocean. In addition, the Taoist mothership highlights another facet of the ship. In an inhospitable world, the mothership exists as a place of simultaneous refuge and violation of hospitality and hostility. So I want to take here the mothership, the kinship relation that's seemingly embedded in the notion of the mothership seriously in thinking about what this relation between the pirate skiff and the Tao can be. Recalling the moment of arrival when pirates appeared at his threshold, Rahimullah, a Dao captain from Mandvi explained, we had just left the port of Salala when we heard on the ship that the Alibabas, what he called the pirates, had been seen by someone not far from where we were. Shipboard radios are a constant source of chatter at sea. Most of the time, he explained, people use it to curse at each other or play bad music. One of the most common things actually that happens on these shipboard radios um, is late at night and this, this banter between Pakistani and Indian boats, um, often around cricket matches and others where national anthems are played and, and, um, and, you know, and, and a whole host of explicit, like, explicit language used that I probably shouldn't and couldn't use um, at, uh, on this, um, um, you know, given this, that the Zoom 
uh, lecture is being recorded, but but it's it's quite colorful and all the kinds of conversation and chatter that happens partly as a way to get past boredom. Um, but in this moment, um, you know, but but it's also used. These shipboard radios are also used to inform about storms, inform about, um, and in 2010, 14, about potentially things that are suspicious. As Rahimullah described it, they left the port late at night, a practice common in the Red Sea ports during the unforgiving hot summer when loading and unloading livestock, the main kind of um, export of the region, occurs during the relatively mild nighttime hours. All of a sudden, before we could head back to port, a small boat came alongside us and fired shots, he said. Alarmed at the gunshots, he slowed down the ship. We didn't know where they were and we didn't want to get killed. So I cut the engine and they boarded us. Were you scared, I asked. In a, you know, he looked at me kind of puzzled. Of course, what else would happen when someone comes on board with the gun? But this was not an ordinary hijacking. They were lost and had run out of water for drinking and for their boat. He explained that they stayed on his dhow for three days and then near Sukhothra, an island between Yemen and Somalia, they got off and disappeared. Mother shipping is built on an ambivalence. Moments of encounters between crews and pirates are certainly fraught with danger and potential violence. Crews are threatened and mistreated, supplies stolen, itineraries disrupted, and losses incurred in these moments of temporary capture. Yet, when these tales are narrated, whether to other seafarers or curious anthropologists, in moments of waiting at port or in homes away from sea, stories of accommodation and recognition are equally prevalent. Thinking through this minor literature of captivity narratives allows us to see these stories beyond mere ideology or a form of Stockholm syndrome and signals the temporary reversals that can occur in this moment of capture. As Rahimullah's narrative signals, lost, hungry, thirsty for water or fuel, or just looking for a place for shelter and replenishment, the pirate arrives at the threshold. This is clearly a moment of violence. The pirate arrives armed and holds the crew hostage through the threat and enactment of force. Yet in the hours, days, and sometimes months of capture, meals are shared, movies watched in the intimacy of the hold. As numerous crew members noted, after a few days, the pirates would keep their guns away. This moment of disarmament does not structurally transform the relationship between pirate and captives or create forms of equivalence between guests and hosts, as many who've sort of worked on hospitality have sometimes noted. There was always this sense, you know, whether it was talking of pirates as Alibabas or, or referring to um, sometimes in very racialized terms, the, the relations, you know, the disparaging Somalis and Somali pirates and their lack of navigation skills. Um, and similarly, pirates too would constantly emphasize a kind of distance and difference between crew members while sharing certain common, um, you know, um, belonging, certain common forms of belonging, and, and importantly, one key mode of distinction and difference always in Somalia from ex-pirates that I talked to was they complained about time on Dao's um, meant, you know, eating a lot of spicy food, and Indian food was far too spicy for the uh, typical East African Somali palate, and, and so they, they were these moments in both narratives, there are always these moments of both similarity and difference, and, and a constant moving between between that. And, and so, you know, so the AK-47 that's put away in the corner, the meals that are shared, the debates over rice versus roti, Somalis preferring either rice or spaghetti versus the Indian and Pakistani penchant for rotis, Bollywood DVDs, which were both enjoyed, were the material objects that mediated this relationship of capture. Instead of a move from sympathy to disavowal, something one sees in narratives of um, captive, uh, captivity narratives of those uh, Western crew members who would say like, I understood why they were doing this, but they're criminal and they should you know, be punished for that. Or even what the theorist Ashil Membe calls the conviviality of the ruler and ruled, what we have are forms of acknowledgement 
of temporary living together in the rocky hold of a ship. A phrase that would come up over and over again from captains was, Am sab garib log hai. we're all poor. It transformed the enemy of all into a fellow traveler. These everyday encounters were moments when the identity of hijacker and hostage, of pirate and merchant, were transformed and reconfigured, though never dissolved. Pirates were always referred to as Alibaba, and you know, their, their Africanness, Blackness, always mentioned. Yet at the same time, there were shared idioms about, you know, being finding themselves on ships with fellow Muslims and others. So there was there was also a way in which, um, you know, similitude and difference keep coming up over and over again in these narratives and in these moments of encounter. Unlike the hold of other ships in other oceans at other times, rendered hauntingly in the works of, of scholars of the Atlantic diaspora, such as Christina Sharp's rendition of the monstrous intimacies of the slave ship. What matters here and what distinguishes the Tao as mothership are the prior histories and forms of engagement that shape the temporality of captivity. And I want to emphasize this um, and end this section by one such story. So this is a person I named Awal, who's a, a former pirate, described to me an unsuccessful attempt at a hijacking. Uh, following that, his crew, you know, they, they were lost at sea. He explained, we were floating without food and water. I could only taste the salt on my lips. One of the crew members had tried to drink water from the sea and was in a miserable condition. As day turned into night, Awal and his crew thought this would be their last night when suddenly a light was visible at sea. When we first saw the Tao, I was worried it was a jinn, but we decided that if the jinn was a mischievous one, there was nothing we could do to resist it. So we set out in pursuit of the light. And as we did, a heavily loaded Indian Tao came into view. We were happy when we got on board. It was a sign from God. And you know, the crew members were all Muslim, so we could pray together. And this is, a, again, a somewhat often romanticized idea that, that would be presented that um, in these kinds of narratives, which were really about um, from a number of ex-pirates of why they gave up piracy. Um, but I think there's something important about the ways the language that is used and the kinds of references to jinns, to um, you know, being on a ship with um, where with with one's religious equals and to be able to perform salat instead of dua. And we were happy when we got on board. It was a sign from God. We prayed together, and then when we returned, I gave up piracy. I will recognition of jinns, his ability to perform salat on the boat was familiar to many Tao captains and part of a shared idiom of understanding encounters at sea. These social relations are what transforms the violence of capture argument into a temporary form of cohabitation. The Tao's mothership is built on and sustained through forms of intimacy and relatedness that emerge in the hold, but crucially exceed the spatial and temporal time of capture. So this moment of capture, this moment of engagement between um, Somali pirates and Gujarati Tao captains is one that you know, is both negotiated in through these everyday objects and through the kind of one-on-one -on -one, face to face relationship, but always is indexing the spatial and temporal time that exceeds that, that is indexing these historical relations, indexing the longer histories of encounter that make that brought East Africa and Gujarat into connection. And in some ways, so, so the argument here and one that I continue in, um, in the next work on ports is that, you know, these spaces of capture are both spaces that are kind of temporally bounded and situated, but also always exceed that spatial and temporal um, kind of attempt to bound them. And, and so whether it's in Tao captains, um, you know, are, are performing scripts of relationships that, ex that exist um, you know, across space and time. So if capture marks a possibility, a way to enter a world of, um, you know, a way to enter the world and make a claim not only on profits and power, but also on each other as fellow travelers. This form of claim making is not limited to pirates. And now I will show through a discussion on port making. My second book looks at ports and straits across the Indian Ocean. 
structured as a ship itinerary, the book moves from port city to port city in each chapter. One of the chapters is the Bosaso port, where I show how creating, a, through the creation of a livestock quarantine, a place of holding, the port came to life. It, it attempts to show how camels get turned into cars. So the port I'm talking about is, um, is Bosaso, which is right here on the Babel Mandeb in the, in the Gulf of Aden, um, and is a, you know, a non-containerized port in the sense it is a port that is only visited by those from um, Kutch and, um, and you know, from India and Pakistan. And, and these, these Daos have been central in, in the making of this port. And the main thing that is processed through it is um, is livestock as well as um, all kinds of other and in return what comes to Somalia is you know basically everything else that uh, is responsible for sustenance. So in the historiography of the Indian Ocean, port cities and increasingly their hinterlands have emerged as key sites to understand the histories and contemporary modes of being and belonging across the Indian Ocean literal. Cosmopolitanism, mobility, and flow are the privileged analytic through which port cities and their inhabitants emerge and understood in this oceanic archive. You know, port cities, however, are also places of holding, as a number of my key interlocutors working in and around ports would note. A successful port is not only some is one, a place that allows for things to move in and out quickly but it is about channeling and holding things. Think about the relationship between ports and warehouses and these other places of storage, right? Like to be a port is not only to be open to the world, but actually to be able to capture that flow and direct it in specific ways. So if pirates attempted to become mobile choke points at sea through AK-47s, fishing skips and cell phones and dows, Ports do so through regulatory regimes, as well as infrastructures of connectivity and stuckness. Through a fo focus on a number of port cities, my current book project emphasizes the social and political lives of port making, as well as the people who move in and out of these places. And this is um, the most of these are um, you know, sort of uh, and, uh, sailors from the global south. And as um, Philip mentioned in the, his introduction, part of what I'm trying to think here is not to think of the question of port um, as 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 labor power and 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 the framework of exploitation, but um, my research looks at you know, things like um, how friendship and kinship and pleasure become ways through which mobility um, is sustained and built in these places. What you know, and something that has often been a kind of privileged status exerted to European travelers or in the pre-modern era to you know to travelers such as Ibn Battuta. So in some ways, part of this project is, is through thinking about port making is, is an attempt to think of, you know, the contemporary Ibn Battutas that move in and out of Indian Ocean port cities. Um, and, 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 and through that, to look at a kind of politics that emerges is that is dependent not on claims over people or territory through language of citizenship, but through circulation and um, and you know through circulation, through through waiting, through drift. Today I focus on one such port city in this talk, Bosaso, a seemingly anachronistic locale whose insights I argue extend far beyond this maritime space. No container ship calls at Bosaso. The channel is too shallow, and gantry panes and other infrastructures of container port making absent on land. What is important in Bosaso is livestock. And on my last trip in 2019, the relative calm of the port was briefly interrupted during Hajj. Dalmar, a livestock trader and my guide for the port had been incredibly busy in the weeks leading up to the Hajj, given a sharp spike in the demand for goats and other animals in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere in the Gulf during the Muslim festival of Eid al-Adha. In 2019, the Hajj was in late summer. Given the intense heat, cargo and livestock was all being loaded and unloaded in the evening, and then ships would sail out at dusk. Every day, a procession of assorted livestock would make their way um, in the evening hours. They would be loaded, 
and then move on to places across the Gulf. Animals are brought from as far away from northern Kenya and the lowlands of Ethiopia and ports like Bosaso through Gujarati Vahans would connect the Red Sea to the crisscrossing hinterland paths of cattle, camel, sheep, and goats. So as we see in the livestock trade, there's very much a kind of moving between the paths of hinterland paths and paths at sea. Right. There's animals, um, these goats end up on these boats and, and part of what I'm um, in, in this port I'm trying to understand again is, is the way that these paths are not maybe epistemologically and conceptually as different as we imagine them to be. That path making at sea and path making on land perhaps you know, share certain um, forms. And as one stands at the Bosaso port, watching these dhows glide in and out, it is tempting to imagine this livestock trade as a timeless vestige of an Indian Ocean past. The temporalities of livestock, the Hajj, along with the seasonality of monsoons, do shape mobility and movement. However, a closer look reveals a more dynamic and recent mode of port making. Bosaso's rise as a port is dependent upon and engenders a transregional politics and mobility, while seemingly existing on the other side of the containerization divide. So far away from the big cargo ships in places like Rotterdam, Dubai, and Singapore, Bosaso is nonetheless dependent on these well-known port cities for a form of um, intermodalism. Uh, through a form of intermodalism, which is namely the, the notion, and this is where um, quarantines and livestock pens become really central, because what Bosaso does and did successfully was um, able to, through the creation of an export license and a medical clearance certificate, um, you know, allow for the trade between um, Somalia and the rest of the world. So that was come in um, and would not go to Somalia because there was nothing to take back. So when, when they were able to export um, livestock successfully, this is what allowed for this movement back and forth to happen, right? It wasn't necessarily some kind of pr older Indian Ocean moment, but simply the fact that Bosaso had a quarantine that would give it an export stamp um, that created this port. And so the establishment of these quarantines, which were backed by and even run at times by Saudis and Emiratis in the 1990s, meant that um, you know, regularize the flow of um, uh, livestock. Because prior to this, all livestock from Somalia in the 1990s first traveled to the port of Aden, where it would be processed and re-exported to more lucrative markets in Saudi Arabia and UAE. For traders like Dalmar, this meant fewer profits. As he explained, if we sold a goat to a Yemeni merchant for $80, they could then um, sell it on for 160 because they had the certificate to send to Saudi Arabia. So the minute they possessed the certificate, not only were traders able to make money, but also Gujarati Daos came to Basaso, bringing with them a whole host of goods, including cars. And, um, and these are, you know, this is these are some of the Dao captains that I worked with. And, and these are some of the many goods that come in, including cars, trucks, and um, you know, camels, which as Delmar said, we were able to turn camels and goats into cars through this livestock license. Wasaso's story of port making was tied to its ability to channel this movement of livestock to the two holds and quarantines and reinvest the new, these newfound profits into shipping other cargo. If the stuckness of piracy was dependent on coercive modes of capture, here, it was licenses and regulatory mechanisms that channeled cargo to holds and warehouses. This is importantly not an alternative trade network, but one that is directly connected to geopolitical and geoeconomic shifts, such as sanctions and the logic of containers and global logistics. The networks of circulation that emerged within, these, um, within the shadows of these global and regional upheaval highlight a logic of port making as intermodalism namely the moving across scales and temporalities. This is not limited to Bosaso and is in fact a key feature of successful port making across ports old and new. And port making, I argue, is about definitely man maneuvering within world systems, not only allowing for frictionless flow, but transforming literal space into a hold, into a choke point of slowdown and constriction. 
so briefly, um, I'm going to quickly now offer some concluding thoughts before opening it up for questions. Um, let me conclude by offering, as in this, you know, as an, an anthropologist, um, I want to offer a brief story of a moment I found myself stuck at sea. We've lost our berth, so we're going to be idling for a bit. From the bridge, I could see the bright lights of the Jebel Ali oil refinery and the hazy outlines of the Dubai skyline. I had gone up to the bridge to watch the at times uneasy encounter between the captain and pilot as they brought the ship into port. However, today there was no captain or pilot on the bridge and the second mate was in a t-shirt and shorts as opposed to full uniform that is the norm for coming into port. He explained there was port congestion and we might be delayed for up to 48 hours. Two days of drift turned into a full week and for the next week we sat anchored offshore so close yet so far, watching, idling in the water, watching the skyline until we drifted into a shipping lane. Then the engine would roar into action and the ship would come back to its original anchorage position. The straight line on the navigation map that was tracing our journey through the Red Sea into the Straits of Hormuz all of a sudden had turned into a child's zigzag scramble. After a week, I was awakened by the sounds of land, the alarm of cranes, the thud of containers as they're loaded onto the ship, trucks backing up constitute the sensory soundscape of container ports. A berth had opened up in the middle of the night and after a week of idling, of drifting, as it's called in um, shipping terms, our ship was portside in Jebel Ali. As I walked up to the deserted bridge, the small crew on the ship was busy with all the tasks that are required for loading and unloading a cargo ship. The familiar sight of cranes and containers stacked in neat rows with trucks moving between them greeted me for one last time on my journey on a cargo ship from Malta to Dubai. Making my way to the ship's office, I said my goodbyes. We posed for photos that were hastily sent to the group WhatsApp and disembarked from this lumbering Leviathan that had brought me from the Mediterranean to the Arabian Sea. Two Indian ship welders had signed off from the ship and the three of us ended up in an air-conditioned minivan taking seafarers to the immigration office at port. The officer at passport control looked a little surprised at my US passport, somewhat out of place in a stack of Romanian, Filipino and Indian passports. As we drove out to the exit, a procession of trucks loaded with containers, all driven by Sikhs um, from Punjab, exited alongside us. Many of these trucks were heading from Jebel Ali to Sharjah, where they would be unloaded and their contents loaded back onto dhows as they make their ways to port in Iran or across the sea to ports that dot the coasts of Kenya, Tanzania, Somalia, and Mozambique. And so, and so on, the cycle continues. Navigating choke points is seldom straightforward. Even big ships find themselves drifting outside ports for a week, waiting for permission to enter. Working across this world of pirates and port makers, I've sought to emphasize the often surprising kinds of things that can happen in times and spaces of waiting. In the hold of a Tao, pirates and their captives find themselves engaging in forms of hospitality and relationality that exceed the time and space of the ship. We discover the newness of seemingly old ports such as Bosasso that sprung to life through livestock and livestock licenses in particularly that transformed camels into cars. Stuckness reveals a logic of circulation that is contingent, dense, and looping. If the logic of the border is Boolean, open versus closed, captive versus free, right? Borders are, are those that we either abolish or we regulate. The logic of the choke point of the kinds of circulation that I'm interested in is of idling, waiting, and drifting. Focusing on pirates and ports thus opens up us up to possibilities that emerge from constriction and slow down. They emphasize the contingent and the surprising as they undo forms of conceptual and temporal domain, providing a corrective to land-based writing that dominates the study of political authority, pirates and ports also reveal a form of polity and sociality that is amphibious, that emerges through claims over mobility and importantly, immobility. They remind us of the unequal nature of this mobility, however, also of the possibilities that always 
perhaps in here in the ability to move. Finally, they highlight moments of fleeting possibility where the weak become strong, where pirates and captives can cohabitate in the rocky hold of a ship, where camels can transform into cars. Echoing W.E.D. Du Bois and his reflections on progress when he asks, and all this life and love and strife and failure, is it the twilight of nightfall or the flush of some faint dawning day? Choke point circulation too pose this question of whether we are witnessing twilight or dawn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jatin. Uh, as usual, an extremely textured talk. And I think, uh, you know, I'll just uh, bring up three or four points that you've raised before we open up. I thought what was fascinating about the talk was that you know, we tend to be beguiled by the ocean. You know, to think in terms of fluidity, circulation, and so on. And what you do is to alert us to the fact that we have to uh, think with a more complex notion of temporality so that stuckness, as you put it, and waiting are part of this longer temporality of movement. So there is fluidity and circulation. There is also stuckness and uh, waiting. And we, these are actually uh, part of uh, the what constitutes the economy of the sea, that these are not, so the stuckness and waiting are not really disruptions, but they're actually inherent in the rhythm. I, I thought that was wonderful. The second thing that you point to, which is very, which is crucial, is also the kind of layering of temporalities in the ocean. So, you know, if you think of, think about Lale Khalili's work, you have, you know, our idea of the ocean is that of these massive container ships that are carrying stuff from, you know, from butter to cars across the ocean and so on. But what you look at is also this persistence of the Dhau trade and uh, the and how the Dhau trade uh, adapts, you know, so that the Pilot, uh, the pirates command you these ships, the thaus are used for transporting uh, uh, goats and so on. So there's a kind of economy that goes on, which is not outside of capitalism, perhaps, but is parallel to the larger maritime capitalism, probably running athwart it, assisting it. You know, one could think about multiple kinds of verbs as well for that. And the third thing that you uh, spoke about was about, you know, where you actually brought in uh, what is increasingly uh, becoming uh, quite central, where we uh, to social theory, which is that we move away from an anthropocentric view of the universe to looking at these relationalities between humans and animals. And where you talk about Bosasa and the uh, religious temporality of uh, cultivation. So there's also the, you know, so at one level, there's a relation between the people who uh, uh, rear the sheep. Uh, and goat and so on and so forth, at, which involves, again, intimacy and hospitality and so on along the same lines as you spoke about, but perhaps one could speak a bit more about that as well, because one doesn't rear animals in some kind of purely calculating an instrumental way. There is a relation that comes up, you know, through the works of Radhika Govindrajan and others who've been working on this, as animal intimacies are crucial. But there's also a connection to a religious temporality, which is that of the Hajj of Eid and so on, which leads me to the last point where you said that there's this kind of acknowledgement that happens and captivity needs to be understood as really uh, not just being confined to the hold, like indenture or slavery, the kinds of histories that you're familiar with, where uh, getting together on the boat where they say, Ham sab garib hai, and you brought in the element of class, but there's also Hamsab Musalman, which I think may be crucial as well in all of this. They pray together. And this signals a longer temporality of the ocean where you had the Arab seafarers. The sea was uh, a Muslim sea before the Portuguese came in, right? And how far that continues. So, I mean, again, a whole range of issues that you've raised here. Uh, perhaps you could go on to uh, questions that may be raised by the audience and you can pick up on some of the themes that I've addressed or not as you wish. Uh, there's some uh, questions in the chat, which you, uh, are you able to look at the chat function, uh, Jatin? Yes, yeah, so I, so I, I do see Just it. pick them up and, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Great, um, thank you, thanks to the, for those comments and apps, you know, all I will say to that is, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, these are these are definitely <coughs> the numerous and, and and very much thinking, you know, one of the key things I want to do is not to sort of say like, you know, that 
that immobility and and this is where I, like the kind of emphasis to moving beyond a certain border boolean way of thinking is not to say like you know the opposite of mo like fluidity is immob mobility is immobility but rather saying like these kinds of disruptions are in fact inherent to what we call circulation and and they are and and so uh, and um, and the consequences of that. So, um, so yeah. So I see uh, there's a question from Emil on uh, the Dao trade. Um, you know, how does the utility of the Dao change from region to region in the Gulf nations? The Daos are mostly used as recreational boats rather than for the purposes of trade. I also see that uh, Neil van Linden. Um, mentions you know that, that that there are and, and this is you know I would agree like absolutely they're still part of this um, trade network and that's one of the kind of fascinating things that you see in um, a place like Sharjah or, you know the kind of evening cruise is going along which is the Dao is marketed for as this like historic um, um, aspect of um, you know recreational tourism while at the same time um, you know, goods coming in uh, from the container port from Jebel Ali containers that are being unloaded, packed onto those that are bound for Iran and East Africa, mostly Somalia, um, and increasingly very much Iran, you know, and there's, there's attempts, I was in Dubai recently, and there are attempts to, to try and screen that to, to push these DAOs out of the city um, and a kind of, a and, you know, so, uh, and, and, the, and the very everydayness of trade that happens uh, that was very visible when I did my research in two, you know, almost 10 years ago now. Um, but, and now there's, there's a desire to in Dubai to put them, you know, out farther away from the kind of central hub of the city where they were near the Gold Souk and other places and in Sharjah as well to, to a DAO specific DAO terminal um, and um, and so there's all I think there's this tension in in the Gulf about you know how how we recognize the relationship of the the centrality of this you know I, I don't want to call it informal trade because it's not but the centrality of this thing that's not container trade that's central that was central to the making of um, Gulf economies and continues to be with a, a kind of projection and an understanding of, of you know, places like um, Dubai, especially as being all about intermodal, you know, cargo to air Emirates, like, you know, Emirates Airlines and cargo um, container ships, right? So, so a part of that um, is, is in many ways a facade because as we, um, as you can see, as you continue to see in spite of you know, um, attempts otherwise, and I think this is where someone like Nidhi Mahajan's work is is really crucial. Is is the continuing importance of this trade in shaping places both in Gujarat but also shaping the everyday life of a city like Dubai, which may want to kind of imagine itself as a city of the future, where the Dao trade is very much relegated to a kind of dinner cruise path, and you know, but 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 is actually very much prevalent. Um, in, in shaping everyday life. All right, so um, I see another question about boat building and asking me whether I would be looking at the Malabar coast, which has a rich maritime history. I would love to, and, um, you know, and if there, uh, and especially, yeah, so as in this project, you know, I would love to be in Kochi. And, um, and if so, you know, if Emil, you have contacts and places and people that I can meet, um, please send them my way. Uh, it would be wonderful, because, because one of the things that I'm really interested in is, um, is looking at contemporary kind of containerized port building in India through which is spearheaded through uh, figures like the Adanis and others often you know sitting cheek to gel to these play older places where um, of, of connection and, and so part of and, you know what what I want to do is say like what happens if we lift that divide between like the Adani Mundra world of Mundra port and Mandvi and say that they're actually, you know, what are the kinds of connections that the people, the places that move back and forth between them. And, and I think there's a similar kind of thing that happens in on the Malabar coast as well is, um, um, and so, so it is to, you know, not to think of these again as artisanal 
nostalgic forms of. Uh, um, so, all right. So then there's another question um, by Afef uh, regarding their everyday devotion and religious encounters of Tao traders. Nidhi Mahajan talks about the Tao from the vessel flag to the worship of women, to pray at Shamurad Bukhari's Dargah while their husbands are away, jinn encounter and acts of Salat and Dua. Seen similar experience with outsider lives in Kerala, mentioned about jinn, have encountered at sea, how they've restricted themselves to bodily desire. How do you view the imaginations of devotion and piety working among the Tao traders as well as pirates, the ways in which they negotiate the ethicality of piracy and their piety? Thank you for this question. Um, and, you know, this very much is um, central to one of the things that, you know, you know, Dilip mentioned, right, that part of what is being, is happening is hamsab karib log hai, but also hamsab musulman hai, hamsa, you know, um, and that there is, there, there was a sense, and this was often debated, so when, you know, and so Dilip, someone would say, oh yeah, the, you know, the pirates are also Muslim like us, and then there would always be one surly captain be like, you know, but, but, you know, but they, what they do is, you know, haram, right, um, piracy right. is, is, uh, they, and and then and then it, there would be a rich um, uh, discussion around the the kind of boundaries of haram and halal, um, and what and what it meant to um, you know to be a pirate and and would it was it ever permissible to do such a thing and and so so that's one way and and this these kinds of um, conversations and contexts would also happen amongst those who were financing, for lack of a better word, piracy um, and, um, and supporting them, uh, you know, through often kinship networks, through like obligations of the app. And, um, and so, so in the article that Dilip had mentioned, I, I talk a lot about this, this precise way in which transforming, you know, piracy into uh, a, a story of obligation was a way of, at times, ethically bracketing some of these questions. And this is something I think Nidhi Mahajan also refers to um, with the Tao traders and questions around smuggling. There are certain things one does not do, but then there are other things that one can ethically bracket and say, this is not a question of smuggling, this is just a question of you know, moving goods from here, like especially around um, you know, smuggled oil, for example. Right. And and weapons that when I would ask Tao captains, like, you know, do you see this as as bad? Sometimes the response would be, well, the you know, the oil thing is just because it's US empire. It's not really actually about ethics here. So we're just they're the ones who have, um, you know, it's, it's power politics and it's arbitrary. But around weapons, there would often be the question of, you know, um, we take things we don't know what's in that. And there's nothing wrong in, in doing that. Um, so, so part of it is to also look at the, the kinds of ethical boxes that, that we create. And amongst those, you know, so one merchant that I follow very closely in my book is someone who I call Aisha. She, was a, uh, she is a prominent cot merchant who would um, trade with pirates. And she would always say, like, why do you call it trade with pirates? What I'm simply doing is you know, extending credit to my kin. And, and nowhere in the Quran does it say that one should not do that. Um, so I think that's, you know, um, so the, those kinds of play, ways also become ways of both at times acknowledging the fact that this is a shared Muslim space, but at times sort of saying, no, no. And, you know, the, I would often be asked, like, why are you um, talking like, you know, a Qadi? Like, this is not your place. Just let's talk business today. So, um, and I see some also questions about uh, sending articles. I've, I've noted, Neil, I've noted down your email address and we'll send you, um, you know, the article and, and also the book. Uh, Teju, you had a question? Uh, yes, uh, but I want to thank uh, Jatin for this absolutely riveting uh, set of narratives that sort of are interwoven uh, in the presentation. Um, I have a curiosity question about the shifting flags. Um, they, if they, do they mean shifting national identities also? Do they have multiple sets of registrations or it's just a bunch of flags they have that they, they pull out the right one and put it up uh, when they're moving through certain waters? That was a really curiosity question. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot. Right, 
it is it is the latter so there is um so you know of course um there is a and and there's a wonderful article that Fahad Bashara has about the use of these movement between um, flags um, by Omani sailors and this ended up being a big international um, case as well about you know that that then sets the legal precedence about um, how the relationship between flags and ships um, but but in the case of this particular kind of um, itinerary of Thou sailors, what these these flags are not always cursed. Their registration remains um, regi uh, an Indian registration, often in the cases of those that are originating there. Um, but but there is a but when they are in when they sort of land in Dubai or in Sharjah, they they have the UAE flag and 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 it's and I was always curious, as it, you know, because obviously it's recognized by the port authorities that this is not a UAE ship, but um, but. But it was seen as a way to signal at sea. So these flags are working at sea to kind of you know, uh, often as, as as being just a, a as kind of saying like you know this is the territory that I'm now in and I like now respect this kind of territorial. Um, so so it's fascinating because there is no legal relationship to these flags, but like all those would have multiple. Um, you know, um, a flag of the various countries that they were going to, and um, and it's and it's often so it becomes a legal fiction in the sense the port authorities act as if the ship, even though we know from the paperwork, it's completely contra mm -hmm. to that. Right. So I have another question, which probably relates to this one, which is about. Um, I was puzzled as to what language the pirates and uh, uh, the the people who are boarded are using the the people up on the tower. Uh, is there some sort of lingua franca that's there, or is is it mutually intelligible what people say to one another? That was uh... so. That's a really that's a really good question. Um, at times, yes, and and often it would depend on some of the biographies, person. So some of the biographies of those who ended up going to sea as pirates. Um, some of them would through, um, you know either like speak Urdu, speak Hindi, um, and so a little bit of Gujarati, depending on if they had worked at a port. Um, others would not. Um, and um, so so it was, you know, there isn't necessarily a kind of shared lingua franca that united them, but um, but they were shared reference, certainly. And I think Bollywood movies turned out to be one of those shared reference that were known um, to both to those who went out to sea, as well as those who um, stayed on land. Um, sometimes it would be a kind of mix of, um, you know, Gujarati, a, a few Arabic words, uh, and and then and then a lot of gestures. As you know, I asked a boat captain this question once, and he said, you know, when a man has a gun, you can understand him very clearly. <laughs> so, so there was also this question of, you know, there was this accommodation, but there was also a relationship always of, you know, the pirate as, as the one who had the gun. So one last uh, sort of query, which is that uh, you, you've been speaking just now about haram and halal and how it was perceived, the action of the pirates and so on. And much of what you've talked about today is not so much about uh, the, the relationship between law and capitalism, which you, it was one of your failing uh, notions, mm -hmm. but really about that which is not law, or that which uh, cannot be law, and that which is perhaps also not capitalism. So I just wondered why the law and capitalism frame was so crucial to your uh, the the larger argument that you were making. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think part of it is the it is a way to you know one of the things I want to do. Um, in both in in the numerous projects that I'm involved in, and it is a is a form of kind of trying to de exceptionalize and perhaps de provincialize, right? To go like to contra um, provincializing Europe to kind of de provincialize the these kinds of spaces. So so it is and and so so there is a comparative element to the story which is to say like here is a space that we would argue is a space perhaps outside of capital perhaps outside of um you know legal systems like courts and then here is a is a kind of economy that is structured through licenses that is structured um you know through the temporality of global logistics 
and look at what happens when we realize that they have, they not only share certain kind of constitutive connections and that their they have dependencies, they both kind of, you know, which is a kind of longer argument that many, I'm thinking of, you know, figures like Claude Miasu and others have uh, looked at of the, the kind of, you know, whether it's Marxist modes of articulation or others that, that you know, things we call pre-capitalist and capitalist always have been in very close relationship to another. So one is a, is a rather perhaps like, um, you know, as, as, as one becomes, older perhaps, like, you know, is there anything new under, you know, but, but thinking with figures like Miyasu, but also someone like, you know, uh, Jerus Banerjee's work on commercial capitalism is to, and, um, you know, is, is to ask like, you know, why, why do we keep this distinction of non-capital, like, you know, why is, um, what is what is at stake beyond um, you know is there analytic clarity that comes from actually saying like you know this kind of economy is is not tied to logistics and this is you know container travel exists in a very different world than Tao trade so part of it is to say no actually empirically they're very connected and it's important to understand that and then another is to peculiarize the thing we call capitalism and so part of you know is is the I juxtapose the port of Bosaso with the port like Djibouti which is um, um, a container port but turns out to have been completely structured through and through in a language, its rise and potential fall is tied to questions around friendship. And, you know, and, and this is one way in which I'm re-narrating the port. Its rise and fall is about like this kind of friendship between the current president and um, one of his close advisors, confidants, who then turns on him. And, and so it's this kind of, you know, so and so saying like, what would happen if we thought of you know, containerization, not as a story of technology, of automation, of technologies coming from you know, what is called the Rotterdam model, which is like, you know, there's a port that establishes itself and then um, then is kind of, you know, mo in a modular form exported everywhere, which is what Djibouti can be understood as, but actually about friendship and betrayal. And, and you know, and that too is is a story of capital accumulation. And, and so I guess that's that's where the kind of larger framing like, is to always kind of point at, well, what do we imagine law and capitalism to, like who are the kind of legitimate actors of law and capitalism? And, and, and what happens if, you know, say, and this, you know, is, and this is one thing I'm wondering, like the, the continuing importance of family firms and families in, in running ports. And why is that, even with container ports, right? Why is that? Why is that so salient? Why is shipping still such a family business? And not only in the kinds of like, you know, Omani families and others, but also like Greek, you know, like there's like the big container ports are run by, you know, DP World is a family run business, Adani. And so, so like what, what, it, what happens if we think of the family for, and again, this is an argument that um, many have made with, regard to capitalism and and the family right that and kinship that these are not separate categories but completely co-constituted right. so thank you yeah, two other questions i mean uh, neil has asked a set of questions but i just wondered before if i could uh, step in at this point uh you know because uh, when i hear you uh, present the paper there's obviously uh, a reference i mean a world of reference which includes nidhi and fahad and Johan Matthew and so on and so forth. But alongside your work, there's also the other work uh, which will have other names, you know, like for example, Mahmoud Kuria, uh, Nile Green, uh, or Ronit uh, Ritchie, or you could think about Wilson Chaco John. So uh, it's almost like you're speaking about the same space, but these two literatures don't intersect. The two literatures being one, that of Indian Ocean Islam, which uh, is very, uh, the, studies tend to be very textualist, theological, the circulation of law in the abstract and so on. And then you have the kind of work that you do and Nidhi does, which is very detailed ethnographic work where you actually look at a kind of uh, the practice, so to speak, of Islam, right? I mean, where you find multiple ways of negotiating, uh, you know, Muslims from Gujarat, Muslims from uh, Somalia, Saudi Arabia, and so it goes back to the question of the lingua franca that Teju was raising. So is it possible to bring these two literatures together, the theological and the kind of subaltern companionate 
kind of Islam and what would it mean to do this? Because it is again about law, right? And both of these are about law in some sense. The second thing which I found absolutely fascinating and I was wondering whether it could be taken somewhere as a theme is this question of radio chattering, which seems to be a transient kind of phenomenon. But if you think about a parallel phenomenon, one thing that COVID and lockdown reminded us or brought to the fore were these TikTok videos that uh, the actual practice of life, the expression of grief, the expression of joy, the rhythms of migration, life, labor, all of them were expressed on TikTok, right? You know, until in June 2020, because of a misunderstanding between the Indian and Chinese government, then TikTok was banned. But this radio chatter, while it is something that is ephemeral, actually uh, speaks to all of the themes that undergird your work, which is that of friendship, companion, intimacy, etc. these joking relations, the classic stuff of anthropology, joking relations between men, those kinds of stuff. So I wondered how one would bring that in. So those were the two questions that I had, and then probably you could take up Neil's after. Great, thank you, thanks. Um, yeah, and, and I think um, absolutely, and, and I think that's one of the, you know, this one way in which I'm trying to move between you know, someone like Mahmoud Korea and uh, Ronit Ritchie and, um, and you know and others and and the the kind of work that has been much more on you know merchants and traders and um, in the Indian Ocean is is in the kinds of and this is something that you know Dilip, uh, you know I, I think with a lot of your work on concepts from the global south here is partly it is trying to um, take in my first book it was to take this question of protection as as and which in you know is both a theological re for a relation relationship it's an economic um, engagement it's 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 a term that um, insurance companies think through it's also um, you know it's it's a term that appears in 13th 14th century manuscripts um, and part of it is to sort of say like what happens if we um, you know what are the kinds of concepts not so much to theorize them but rather to to you know to you know so it's not about like these are not places good to think with, which has been the classic kind of anthropological move, right? To say like, Bosasso is good to think with because it, un, um, but rather to say, what are the conceptual vocabularies that my interlocutors are engaged in? And to use that as a way to jump across or move between the, the kind of theological and the everyday, the kind of economical and the, his, you know, the anthropological and the historical. Um, so, and, and, you know, and in some ways like the Indus, and, and there's always for me a, a desire to, to, you know, to, um, and perhaps it's, you know, it's something that I may grow out of, but, but also to kind of point to those who who fetishize the world of capital as as, a, as always a, even in their critiques of Eurocentricism end up kind of being Eurocentric, right? Where all from, from the 15th century, the only actors on the world stage have been white men. And partly it is always to say, well, well, no. And, and in fact, you know, as many have shown like, you know, Lakshmi Subramaniam's work, like without certain kinds of credit networks, British accumulation would not only be difficult, but nay impossible. And so, so I think that's so it, it is to try and you know work with these kinds of concepts that emerge in these spaces as vehicles to move between and across these multiple scales. So that's that's um and and I try to in the work on piracy it was really to sort of say protection, aman, aban, as uh, you know, aman is this kind of deeply theological concept of what is my obligation to a stranger and, um, and, and you know, an Islamic law becomes tied to questions around, you know, who are protected, who has a protected status in Islam and versus who don't and, but also becomes a mode to, to think about, you know, someone showing up, um, the kind of everyday encounter that happens. So, so, I, so that's, that would be kind of my answer to that is, um, is, is that, you know, there's definitely like the kind of world of reference that I'm trying to, is, is also, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in, in part because a lot of these are, you know, to think a lot of these scholars are friends and fellow travelers is to, <laughs> is to also sort of 
like to kind of say like you know bring them all along for the ride so to speak um and then and absolutely you know like tiktok videos have been very crucial in the last two years because of covid i haven't been able to be on ships so much of this project was um as i had imagined it was dependent on spending all this time on ships and um tiktok and instagram became ways to interact with sailors as they were because this, this is definitely a current, like a, a language that they are interested in to talk, to you know, reflect on questions around boredom, but there's a way in which the kind of invisibility of life at sea becomes very visible. If you like, you know, look at TikTok videos about sailing, the seafarer, or the hashtag seafarer on Instagram, you will see, you know, multiple kind of reels and videos, like you know, thousands and thousands of them that really bring like everyday life of the sailor and um, in. And I'm, I'm really, you know, um, thinking, you know, there's a, there's a kind of publication that I'm sort of slowly making my way through that tries to make sense of all of this seemingly ephemeral and um, you know chatter and and saying that this is quite central and and one of the things that on radio that I didn't talk uh, much about here is coming you know obviously the radio is also used by naval vessels to to constantly surveil this space right so and in the same way that TikTok and Instagram are not you know, simply these kind of subaltern spaces. Um, and as especially as, as you mentioned, the become embroiled in all kinds of geopolitical contests when India decides to ban it and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so on and so. Um, so, so yeah, so I think that, and I think that does relate to Neil's question on Gulf pearl fishing and musical culture. So, you know, on Daos, it is these radios, it is music, it is movies, um, but, um, but also, something you know um there there were obviously longer you know most people when i would ask like you know are there specific songs you sing would just kind of say like no you know my phone and there's this great um documentary that um camp a collective in mumbai uh, did called from gulf to gulf to gulf and it really one of the things you really see in that i mean they they gave you know is the kind of relationship of cell phones as both these repositories of you know, connections to friends and family, but also as these repositories of music of um, um, that becomes the sort of sound, which includes music that is both, you know, kind of Bollywood to Nishat, Nishids and others. So it's, it's you know, both religious and secular. Um, and, and that's very central to, to this kind of world of circulation. Um. We still have time, right, uh, Tiju? We, how much time do we have for questions? Well, we have about two minutes. Oh, two minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. Uh, if anyone has a burning question, we can, of course, continue. I, I don't suppose any burning question, but actually, I, I just want to, I mean, the thing is that when somebody, uh, you know, one doesn't get to see uh, friends often, and when they appear on screen and their work is just assuming dimensions that one had... Uh, you know, uh, probably not uh, foreseen. I mean, one of the things that stuck me about this work, uh, about what you were saying, is that, you know, there's this question of life and there's the question of waiting that you speak about, but there's also the other kind of literature which is on death. I mean, the death of, you know, shipbreaking, Alang, Chittagong, and so on. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how one, uh, is it possible again? I mean, this is again to kind of try and expand your argument, uh, because that's, of course, connected with capitalism uh, in, in some kind of, Way, but it's also not connected with capitalism because you're also talking about spaces that existed prior to the emergence of Western economies, et cetera, et cetera. Shipbuilding and shipbreaking are kind of joined at the hip. So I wondered whether uh, uh, that story, the kind of work that Lindsay Bremner and others are doing on uh, places like Alang and Chittagong, uh, uh, whether that could be brought into the story and if so, how? Great. Um Yes, yeah, so, you know, one of the fascinating thinking about flags, oftentimes um, ships will have a like will have a special flag just for when they are going to places like Chittagong. And, and part of this has to do with, um, I mean, both regulatory things. So like if a ship is, say, um, an EU flag or Maltese flagship, which is a very common thing because it's it gives you EU access, but also 
you know, not as maybe, you know, less taxation than say like being French flagged. So a lot of the um, ships, the cargo, big cargo ships that I work with um, are, you know, Maltese. Um, and, but, but because there's EU kind of environmental regulations and others, so if you want to send your ship for, um, to be broken down in, in Bangladesh and in Pakistan and in India, um, you would have, you know, there's like all kinds of regulations around toxic disposal that, that um, so ships avoid that by becoming for, you know, for their last journey, getting flagged in Palau or Mongolia even. And, you know, these other, like what are very much flags of convenience places that, you know, will just kind of, you know, these are countries that use flagging as a, as a way of just revenue collection, but there's something, you know, so there's a kind of story of wage, of, of exploitation, of profit making, but there's also something kind of, you know, to me, sort of this like processional march, uh, this idea that you have here is your final flag. And, and, and a lot of people who are on that ship see that as this, like, you know, mm -hmm. as you go on this journey, this is, this is the last time this ship, you know, the kind of affective bonds that you form with, with this hulking piece of metal. And, um, and so, so that's one place that I, I think, I really think a lot about where these two come, where the kind of, you know, yeah. where one could narrate this as, as a, story of of hyper exploitation and dead capital and so but also as as this deeply kind of you know somber tale of and 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 then the other um mode is and this is something that you know i, I had plans ambitious plans pre-covid on doing research on was was built around um you know one moment of recognizing so like you know in that you know Osama bin Laden when he's captured and killed by the U.S. is um, buried at sea, and part of the reason, the justification for that is given by that they didn't want to create um, a grave that would then create a kind of full circulation around it. So, so it had got me thinking, and this is something that I've been kind of thinking about both like burial at sea as something that then re-emerges as a sustainable option in mm -hmm. in certain kinds of um, circles as well so so this um so this idea of you know burial as sustainable as um at sea as as the kind of again the multiple sort of uh, narrations that get you to thinking about what death at sea means and and potentially you know what it um, can't and you know and i I can all, you know, unfortunately, I've never, I haven't gone too far with this, but this is something that I've been really, you know, these two kinds of narratives are sort of stuck in my head right, right. of like, and how to, what to do with that. And of course there's I mean, this, you know, there are tales of accidents and, um, and, and ships that disappear. And, and I think I'm quite fascinated, you know, which is a sort of fascinating tale, like, and, and, and in fact, you know, one of the ways that I, as someone who, has, you know, got interested in this one is is a story is a personal kind of familial story of a family member who worked at sea whose ship disappeared and was never found and you know I think as a kid I always scratched my head around the idea that something this big could just vanish and yet it does so yes yes Bermuda Triangle flying Dutchman. right I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how do we uh we do, do do we do a vote of thanks and so on right now would you like to <laughs> yeah unless anyone else has a question or unless jatin has uh, any last words yeah, i just wanted to thank you for this invitation i also you know um noticed that someone had asked another person had asked for um and the article and i'm happy to to certainly send that send that along so i've, I've noted your emails so. Uh, I think, Jatin, someone wanted to know how to access your PhD thesis. I guess through the usual um, means, right? The, the Yeah, through the usual means. Yeah, my, so I would, I would, you know, sort of gently nudge them towards the book version of the thesis, as many of us know that you know, some of these thoughts were m much clearer in, in that form, uh, the book form than the PhD form, but... Uh, this oh, like, yes, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Dilip. No, there's a last question here from Neil, uh, which is in addition to, it's kind of an extension of the question that he had asked earlier. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, so 
So not, I mean, so a musical tradition before cassette, radio, and phone. Um, yes, I mean, of course, there there are, you know, this is, and here, but I only know of this through some of the secondary literature, um, you know, through people who worked on um, uh, kind of older worlds of the Tao. Um, and, you know, it's just in terms of like my encounters with both the Tao as well as cargo ships, like, you know, partly as an, and this is where, again, you know, because uh, say it's sort of like as an anthropologist, I was, I was struck very much by what the people I were encountering were doing in the present and the ways that they were thinking about what they had perhaps done in the past. And, you know, these are, so the acoustics, so, so I think I've, you know, so this is more my perhaps blind spot in that, you know, I was very struck by the kinds of acoustic registers that happen on ships um, of all kinds, which, are much more popular, much more, you know, much more kind of technology driven. So karaoke, for example, is is one very, you know, and I have, you know, in the book I imagine writing a whole chapter on karaoke um, as, as a place, as a way of kind of breaking down some of the racialized, but also reinforcing some of the racialized boundaries that of of crew between crew members on cargo ships. Um, in so, you know, so. So in that sense, there is there is perhaps a Tao music. Um, it's but in its current iteration, in the kind of moments that you know that I find myself interested in Tao's, it's one that is on phones, on cassettes, and on radios. So, right. And actually, if you're interested, there's the Afro-Asian musical traditions across the ocean project right. from the University of Cape Town, mm -hmm. which is uh, led by Arishitas and Sumangala Damodaran back in India. And uh, there have been any, uh, a few masters, PhDs, conferences, workshops, music that actually tries to think with the uh, forms of music that existed uh, prior to the more uh, uh, capitalized, you know, the cassettes, right. CDs, and so on. <laughs> so the insurrections ensemble, those who want to listen to it, the insurrections ensemble music is online, and that can, tries to capture some of the sounds of an earlier soundscape on the ocean. So, Absolutely. I mean, it, it's fascinating the work that's being done on the ocean, and you probably get those people in as well. But thank you, Jatin. Thank you mm -hmm. for that uh, wide range of issues that you've raised, as usual. And so thanks to me and over to my co-host, as they do in the Oscars. Teju, do you have anything to say? <laughs> well, thanks uh, to everyone. Thanks to all the people who braved the Navratri noise, wherever they are, mm -hmm. and uh, made it to this talk. So thank you very much. I'm, I know there would have been more people here, except I guess people are traveling this weekend. Uh, and I, I know that once they've listened to your uh, recording, they will have questions, which we will ask you when you come to visit us. Um, Sounds so good. Thank you again. Thank you very much. And please keep us posted about your movements. Uh, thanks, Dilip, for moderating this. And uh, yes, uh, good night to everyone else and a happy breakfast to Jatin, whatever. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love to your baby, yeah, yeah. Jatin. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you again for inviting me. I really um, appreciate it and look forward to catching up in person with both of you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.